Most species follow one of two reproductive strategies, K-selection and R-selection. Species that follow the R-selection strategy can have many children at once, investing relatively little resources into each individual child. They become capable of reproduction at a very young age and have short lifespans. This strategy is mostly followed by smaller prey animals who have a low chance of surviving into old age. Then there is K-selection. Species that follow this strategy tend to have long lifespans. They seldomly bear children, but when they do, they make sure to have only one or two at a time so that the children can get the full attention of the parents. Until a thousand or so years ago, it was thought that intelligent species could only be capable of case selection for a multitude of reasons. In any society where intelligence matters more than physical strength, one well-educated individual can accomplish more than ten uneducated can. Add to this that childhood deaths are basically non-existent for most species capable of developing technology, as even a wooden spear or bow can ward off predators, and it's easy to draw the conclusion that any intelligent species would evolve to have very few children. A good example of this are the Quets. Quet females are only capable of getting pregnant once every 30 years. This ensures that any child will get the full attention of their parents for their entire childhood. Intelligent species, of course, also evolve to have extremely long lifespans. Education takes a long time, and having to educate a new generation every few years is very inefficient. If becoming a world-class surgeon takes 50 years of education, a surgeon that becomes 200 years old will be able to operate for 150 years. Two surgeons that each become 100 years old, however, will only be able to operate for 100 years. Any species that has technology which requires extensive education to fully grasp should have long lifespans. An example of this are the Zerath. The average Zerath is to be almost 4,000 years old, and they don't become fertile until they are about 500 years old. This ensures that any child will be born to parents that have already had ample time to get educated and build up the wealth and knowledge required to raise a child in the best possible circumstances. When humans were first introduced to the galactic community, people thought that they would be the same. At a first glance, they seemed to be. Families typically only had two or three children, and using nanotechnology they could become hundreds of years old. They seemed like a typical case-selected species. What we didn't know was that this was all a facade. Culture and technology could hide the biological roots of humanity, but they could never erase it. The first time we noticed something was wrong was approximately 120 years after they joined the Galactic Council. When the humans joined, they, like any other species, were given ownership of the 15 solar systems nearest to their home system. Most species would use these solar systems simply for their resources. Small mining missions would be sent, which would then bring back minerals to the homeworld, where they could be used to create a post-scarcity society for a small but stable population. Of course, sometimes colonisation happened. If a species felt they had more than enough resources to support a second planet's population, they would send some settlers to another planet. This process, however, would take many thousands of years because of the slow population growth. Humans were different. 120 years after joining the Council, humans had already colonised all 16 systems they controlled. When they joined their total population, number 40 billion spread across three planets in their home system. Now, it was almost 800 billion. They have more than doubled their population every 30 years. After doing this, they asked the Council for permission to settle more solar systems. Solar systems aren't exactly a scarce resource in the galaxy, and because of that, they were given 16 more systems. 50 years later, those were completely settled as well. They once again asked the Council for more planets. The Council answered that they would have to discuss it first. Of course, there were species with more than 32 systems. The Theli controlled over 90 systems, and the Fevats were close behind with 75. However, both of those had attained those planets over many tens of thousands of years, not over less than 200 years like the humans. The Council eventually granted the humans permission to settle more colonies, stating that there is plenty of space in space, that's why it's called space. The Fevats disagreed. The humans had a history of warfare, conquering and enslavement on their own planet, and it was to say they wouldn't do exactly that to other species once they became too strong to be stopped. At the speed they were growing, they would be the most numerous species in the galaxy in a few hundred years. Not even a month after humanity had been given another 16 systems by the Council, humanity had already sent almost a million people to the world of Cavalara. Then, out of nowhere, a Fevad fleet arrived and nuked the planet from orbit, killing everyone. 
This caused what is now known as the Great Human Fefat War. By all metrics, the Fefats should have easily won. They had over four times the population. Their technology was over a thousand years more advanced. And they still had knowledge of intergalactic warfare from the days before the Council was formed. The size of the Fefat army numbered 200 billion, compared to the BC 40 billion strong human army. And for every Fefat that died, 10 humans would. This war was hopeless for humanity, and everyone knew it. For some reason, however, the Fevers were unable to advance. They would kill wave after wave of human soldiers, but the waves kept appearing and kept getting bigger. Learning to pilot the complex warships of the Fevat took almost 100 years, which humans could learn how to pilot their simple ships as children. The standard military academy of the Fevers took over 300 years, whereas humans could become soldiers in mere months. After 150 years, 200 billion humans had died, and only 20 billion Fevats. The Fevat army now had 180 billion members, and the human army, 150 billion. Despite losing 200 billion soldiers in combat, the human army has still grown by 110 billion. The war continued for another 150 years, and the death ratio kept shifting in favour of the Fevats. Their expert strategists, who had over 600 years of training, had now completely figured out human strategy, and were able to counter it with ease. For every Fevat that died, 50 humans did. But still, the human army was growing. No matter how many humans the Fevats killed, there would always be new ones to replace them. The Fevat army now numbered 140 billion, whereas the human army consisted of 500 billion soldiers. The humans' total losses were calculated to be over 2 trillion, yet in this time period, humans had not only kept their army growing, but even settled over 30 new systems, and even the best Fevat strategists starting having trouble defending their planets from such an overwhelming force. The Fevats were desperate. Every day the war went on, the difference would become bigger and bigger, until they wouldn't be able to defend anymore. They launched a missile containing 5,000 kilograms of antimatter straight to Centauri B, a planet close to the centre of the human empire. The humans hadn't expected such an attack there, and hadn't protected the planet adequately, which meant the planet got hit. Of the 15 billion inhabitants, only the 5 million that happened to be underground, or in the air at the time, survived. This enraged the humans. They wanted revenge, but they didn't have the facilities to manufacture those amounts of antimatter quickly. After three months of all particle colliders in the human empire producing antimatter non-stop, they finally had enough antimatter for one rocket. They set forth towards Jotania, the second biggest Fevat planet, home to over 15 billion people. The Fevats expected this and protected the planet. Over 50,000 high-power lasers and railguns were put in orbit, capable of destroying any object that came near. Any object sent by humans would be obliterated in mere seconds. What happened after was the deadliest fight in the history of the universe. Once the missile was in the range of the defences, it would need five minutes to reach the planet. Each of the 50,000 defences could shoot once every 30 seconds, meaning approximately a million shots would be fired. The humans only had one missile, and it had to hit. So over 1.5 million small human ships, each piloted by a crew of 10, volunteered to defend the missile. They flew in front of and around the missile, creating a human shield. The defences of the Fevos kept shooting, and with every shot, ten humans died. When the rocket had reached the planet, one of the 1.5 million ships had been destroyed. The remaining 500,000 ships simply kept flying forward. It was too late to turn around now. They had already entered the atmosphere, and were flying towards the planet at relativistic speeds. The rocket crashed into the planet and exploded, along with the 500,000 fast-flying spacecraft, which had now become de facto armed relativistic missiles. Of the 15 billion inhabitants of Yatania, only 5 million survived. The Fevos quickly asked for peace and the humans accepted it. Although they were winning and wanted to get revenge, the war would still have claimed billions of human lives had they kept going, and so they wanted it to stop too. The secret of humans? Disease. On Earth, there are these little self-replicating strands of RNA called viruses. They are not alive, yet they can kill hosts. They do this by entering the cells of the victim and hijacking the production of the cell to only produce copies of itself. Cells shut down and die, and the host died, but not before spreading the virus to new victims. Earth is not the only planet which has viruses. Idrion, the planet of the Quet, has them too. The difference, however, is that the Quet evolved to be mostly immune against the viruses that could target them. Humans, however, due to their symbiotic relationships with dozens of different species, could never evolve total immunity because a virus that targeted different species could simply randomly start to attack them. For most species, once it became intelligent enough to cross spears, childhood mortality dropped to zero, 
and they could switch to 4K selection. Humans, however, didn't have this privilege, because of these viruses. Child mortality stayed high up until they invented electricity and steam engines, and as such, they never evolved away from our selection. While they generally chose to only have a few children, one human female can have 8 children per decade, and all of those children can be combat ready in as little as 16 years. This is what lets humanity expand faster than the rest of the universe combined. Currently, 500 years after the war, humanity controls over 40% of the Milky Way. The rest of the Galactic Council combined controls 7%. As for the players that were bombed during the war, Andromeda B was back to its original production levels 200 years after the bombing. Yotania still hasn't even reached 1% of the 15 billion it once had. Disease, something which humanity has often regarded as its biggest curse, turned out to be the source of their greatness.